know, it's, it's a very good point because for digital diplomacy at the beginning, uh, it was actually the middle-sized countries that jumped on the bandwagon because they wanted to be able to punch diplomatically above above their weight. So it's one thing when you think about United States or China, you know, doing digital diplomacy, but they are heavy lifters. You know, they 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 are big countries. They already have influence in international politics. Smaller country wants to become visible. They want to be seen. And I think digital diplomacy was, a, 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 for many at the beginning, you know, uh, an instrument to increase that visibility. I'm talking about Scandinavian countries, uh, Denmark, Sweden, Finland. These are medium comparable with Chile, right? I'm talking about Israel. I'm talking about Australia. So from this point of view, uh, more recently, uh, it's also Mexico who started, you know, to be quite uh, proficient in terms of digital diplomacy. So visibility, it's one aspect um, that I think it's important. And um, uh, especially for areas that people don't know much about you, I think it's a, it's an advantage. Because when you are to make the first impression, make sure that you do it well. So it's not that Chile doesn't have relationship, but you know, Asia Pacific is it's a very important area and they've been cooperating quite a long, um, uh, for a long time. So um, I think, you know, there is an opportunity to build on that um, and to um, uh, increase this, this uh, visibility. Visibility uh, opens up opportunities. Once people know about you, it increases opportunities. Opportunities that uh, in terms of commercial opportunities, right? I mean, people know more about you uh, and they may want to engage with you and they trade with you, but also political opportunities. Um, one way in which uh, smaller countries also or medium-sized countries, you know, make an impact with digital is bilateral, right? In terms of, you know, talking to uh, uh, audiences in, in various sources, but also multilateral. Multilateral meaning, you know, in the UN venues, New York, Geneva, or other multilateral organization. I looked at uh, uh, digital diplomacy in international conferences, and I think that's a particularly interesting because, again, you want to be seen as a country that is contributing to the global good. Global good may be climate change, maybe you know uh, problems that uh, can be addressed, you know, um, peace and conflict. And I think you know having a digital presence in multilateral conferences comes with this uh, produces this kind of benefit. It aside, it, it increases your opportunities and um, uh, maximizes your diplomatic. Uh, it increases your visibility and maximizes your diplomatic opportunities. So it's both bilateral, but also multilateral. I would uh, I would say. It's a, it's a very good point. I mean, especially uh, coming uh, for me, coming from Europe, when this decision, as you know, uh, has been taken in a different direction in the past few years. They started with China, but now China is more or less out of the picture. And we have to understand why. Um, digital infrastructure, as I said, I mean, what is important nowadays is, yes, uh, digital diplomacy, the social media was made possible by a particular technology, 3G, 3G. This is why we have all this application. We are now at a different stage. The different stage is 5G. 5G, it increases connectivity. It allows to create a new, uh, many other new opportunities, including you know, real-time work uh, and so on and so forth. So you need to have the digital infrastructure in place. And that it can be a big, ginormous boost for your economy. For your digital economy, right? With digital, imagine that you can uh, operate remotely a truck from afar. Um, it, it can be done this, right? And it can change a lot of a lot of, of work uh, in the way in which you operate. Now, with the 5G and the coming 6G, you need the infrastructure in place. Here comes a problem. What kind of infrastructure? There are not so many uh, companies around the world that can provide. There are two Europeans. Nokia and Ericsson. Uh, there is Huawei, right, in China and a few others. American companies are so and so. They started to invest a little bit more into, into that. So there is a, a, an issue here to what extent you rely on certain suppliers, which later might become uh, problematic. Why problematic? Because there are two models the American model and the Chinese model. 
The American model is one in which you have private companies and the government not necessarily working together. Actually, remember Apple a few years ago made the point not to allow the US government to access an iPhone, um, which was uh, used in a terrorist attack, exactly to emphasize we are not uh, cooperating. So to increase, you know, this confidence that, you know, um, um, Apple is, is doing, you know, uh, rightly. China is a different model. China in which you have companies and, and government working together. And here comes a problem especially if we have the background of the Ukrainian crisis uh, in, in, uh, here in Europe, when you create a dependency on an unreliable supplier, meaning in the case of Europe was, you know, Germany and other countries became reliant on Russian gas. And in a case of conflict, then you have a big problem. The same logic now was transported to the uh, question of 5G. What if uh, yeah, uh, Chinese technology is cheaper and to a certain extent more advanced in certain areas. But what if, given the geopolitical tensions, uh, in five years from now, we are we're going to be in the same situation like Germany versus Russia in terms of gas? So that's the concern, because if you have developed a digital economy that is relying on a particular technology supplied by someone who is not a very friendly nation to you or potentially rival, then you have a problem then because uh, uh, it can come with political strings. So that's uh, the issue here uh, in a sense. Now, going back to your question, can you have both? I think that it's, a, 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 it's not about the fabric, uh, the, 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 the cable uh, per se that uh, you, know, you communicate, but also what comes at the end of the ca uh, cable. It's a cable coming with a lot of other infrastructure, Chinese infrastructure that is going to interact with American infrastructure. Well, you know, that's a, a, a tricky decision. But uh, the key issue here that probably it was discussed in the Congress was um, how much are we vulnerable to being, uh, uh, you know, strategically vulnerable in case uh, in which relationship are not doing particularly well. So uh, that's that's a, a problem. Uh, the way in which Europe, just can say, you know, Europe started to react to the uh, Russian uh, uh, problem with gas was to diversify. That is, you know, not only to get gas from uh, Russia, I mean, Russia is closed now, but from Nigeria, from Qatar, from the United States, not to become, again, dependent on any single supplier. And maybe there is a lesson here also for the digital. How much infrastructure you allow to have control of your digital economy with one supplier, whether it's United States or China, probably the rule of thumb probably should be less than uh, than 10% uh, or 20%. But the digital, uh, it's a different game than, than gas, right? It's more difficult because there are not so many countries. Ideally, maybe, you know, you can develop your own technology. So that would be a, 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 different, uh, a different game.